Yeah. Just so you know, the recording is in progress. So I'm not sure to be on your best behavior. Right. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Grant Hunter. Yes, well, I'm sitting on that. If you don't want to sit in the front row, you can sit like next to me if you want to. <laughs> I know how some people are about sitting in the front row. So anyway, welcome to those here in the room, those joining us virtually, and perhaps those even watching us after um, the recording gets sent out and posted on, on the interwebs. Uh, today, we are, have the pleasure of restarting our adult education forum and having the opportunity to uh, learn and, and discern from our scholar in residence, Dr. Dan Duffenbaugh. And today, he appears to be talking to us about the introduction to Hebrew wisdom tradition, which I know nothing about. So I'm excited to learn about that. And knowing Dr. Deppenbach, it will be absolutely enthralling. So Dan, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, well, great. Uh, it's so nice to, gosh, see actual faces face to face, right? And if I'm, if I'm, if you need me to speak up, I don't know how I'm coming through with a mask, but I'm supposed to keep this mask on for all of your uh, health and well-being and everything. But um, Greg and uh, Damon, they sit down every, you know, first of the semester, and they look through what's known as the Revised Common Lectionary. If you're familiar with that, um, if you're not, I'll just tell you very quickly. Uh, it's a way that we in the church can read through roughly 80% of scripture over a three year period of time. And so you have your A, your B, your C, and uh, the readings for this particular cycle and this month uh, include a lot of literature from a part of the Bible that's not very well known. Uh, and it's too bad because uh, uh, many people find that some of their most, um, their favorite verses happen to come from what's known as the wisdom literature in, uh, in the Old Testament. Now, most of these uh, classes are going to, uh, to have to deal with the Old Testament simply because we find, um, or most people find that, you know, some people tend to know the New Testament fairly well, but when it comes to the so-called Old Testament, uh, it's just like dusty, you know, uh, tablets that were left someplace and are in, in no way relevant to us uh, much anymore. But nothing could be further from the truth because the uh, I should really be more accurate and call it the Hebrew Bible. Anybody know why I want to do that? Hebrew Bible instead of Old Testament. Is it something to do with the Torah? Torah. Well, one of the things we want to make sure we do is there's something known as supersessionism, and that is somehow with Christianity came along that just completely wiped out the relevance of everything that happened in the Torah and the so-called Old Testament. So it, it's kind of a value judgment, right? This is old and hey, we're, we're the new and improved. When in fact, um, it creates real problems for us because nobody starts to read a book two thirds of the way through the book, right? Uh, nobody does that unless, or if they do, they're not getting, you know, the backstory. So when we read scripture, we have to keep the entire story from Genesis one all the way to Revelation 22 in mind uh, because it is an epic story and one of the things we tend to do unfortunately is we read and i know people do this but you know people who do this they okay god is going to tell me what i'm going to do today and they open the bible here it is and here's my i call that the magic eight ball approach to reading the bible. <laughs> okay okay asking a question you know uh, nobody does that with any other book right this is literature. Uh, there are a variety of genres in this, uh, in this text, and it has a historical context in which it was written. So uh, in a more scholarly or academic approach to uh, reading scripture, we try to understand what the historical context was in which the text was written, who was writing it, and to whom was the text being written, what language was it being written in? Um, was it trans is our current text translated? Well, of course it's been translated into English, but there are some texts that began in Hebrew, translated into Aramaic, 
translated into Greek, translated into Latin, translated into whatever vernacular, which may have been English or German or, or Spanish or whatever. So uh, a lot of language study has to go into um, trying to get back to what the original sense of the scripture passage was. Um, and this is, a, this is not to say that a devotional reading of the Bible is uh, something that should be disparaged because I'm not saying that at all. Uh, this is something that I hope we all do uh, on a regular basis is look to the Bible for guidance, uh, uh, knowing that it is inspired by God, but also recognizing that there is a human element in the writing of the text. Uh, we will find discrepancies in the text with respect to historical accounts. For example, how did King Saul die? Well, one text will tell you that he uh, fell upon his sword. Another text will tell you that he was uh, killed by a, a warrior. I mean, there, there are examples of this throughout uh, scripture. Probably the most famous is um, on what day did Jesus die? You know, uh, you know, we all know it was Good Friday, but if we read the book of John, Gospel of John, it's the day before uh, the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, say that it was. The day of preparation for Passover or the day of Passover. So if you hold to a view of scripture that says, you know, this fell out of the sky completely perfect, um, you have a very difficult time explaining those discrepancies. Um, and people will do all kinds of, you know, theological and uh, rational gymnastics to try to make it work. But one of the ways you can make it work is to say, look, this book is a testimony of faith inspired by God in certain historical contexts, but interpreted through the lens of human experience. It's a record of God's liberating acts in history and a testimony of faith by those who experience those acts uh, of liberation. So all just a, a very brief introduction to um, you know, how it is that we tend to go about this, but getting back to the Revised Common Lectionary, this month and into October, you'll be reading some texts from uh, a tradition known as the Wisdom Tradition. Now, in the Revised Common Lectionary, sometimes we don't always read all of the texts, but there are certain books of the Bible that we don't often get a chance to, uh, you know, to, to really delve into. One of those being the Song of Songs. Do you know that one? The sexiest book in the entire Bible, right? <laughs> I want really... to write it that moment in. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You know, this is the one about the you know, your breasts are like twin fawns feeding among the lilies. Did you know that that was in the Bible? I mean, really, really erotic stuff. Yes, Greg. Would you... uh, just good morning. <laughs> Wonderful to see you all. So glad we're after 18 months. We're back to having in-person adult ed. So. Thank you all for being here, Dan. Thank you for teaching. Yeah. Do we have anybody who's actually zoomed in right now? Yes, uh, oh, Anne. Excellent. Anne, Hi, Ann Volpe. Ann Volpe is, is zoomed All right. In. Well, good. So. I just wanted to say thank you and it's wonderful to see you all. Yeah. So, so uh, when we talk about wisdom literature, we're first of all talking about literature that's in the Hebrew Bible, and it's a certain genre of literature. There are historical texts or texts that purport to be uh, history, you know. And King David and King Solomon and then you know the, the split of the kingdom things like that there is poetry uh, there is uh, prophetic literature there's apocalyptic literature and then there's this <clears throat> genre called wisdom and it occupies a, a pretty specific place in Hebrew history and that's what I our, our our study will be four weeks long and today I just want to give you a sense of the historical context in which uh, this literature arose. But it's very simple. Uh, the books are relatively few. Uh, there are the Proverbs, and I think it's next week. One of the Proverbs 1 is in the lectionary reading. We'll see if, if Greg and Damon choose to, uh, to use that because we don't always read all of those. Um, there is the book of Job. We'll have a good time talking about the book of Job, and it's historical context as well. Um, there is a great book 
if you've been to a funeral, <laughs> you've probably heard something from the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, and interestingly enough, when, when I ask people, well, what's your favorite book of the Old Testament? They will, many of them will say Ecclesiastes. And the irony of this a wisdom literature is that it is probably as far removed from Israelite theology as you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. So there was something that was happening in the time that it was written that was really challenging the status quo of Israelite theology. There are some other books uh, I should mention that there are some Psalms in uh, the collection of Psalms that have a wisdom orientation. And I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'll, but I just want to give you the names of these books so far. Psalm 1, Psalm 8, Psalm 19. And I'll, I'll read that for you today if we uh, get to that point. Uh, Psalm 104, uh, Psalm 119. You will know them when you hear them because they are usually psalms that are talking about the glory of creation. Look how wonderful this world is. Uh, uh, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. You know, day to day brings forth speech. Their, their song goes out, but no words are heard. That's Psalm 19, something along those lines, paraphrasing here. Um, there is, there's kind of a mystery that's involved in, in this literature that people want to uh, be enthusiastic about. They want to extol the virtues of. Now, this is quite different from what we usually think of in terms of Israelite theology, right? Because there's no mystery. God tells you to do this, and that's what you're supposed to do. Right? If you do this, you will be rewarded. If you don't do this, you will be, there will be some sort of sanction that comes against you. That's not what we're talking about in wisdom. In the wisdom literature, it looks at things like, hey, here's this wonderful guy. He's doing everything right, right? His name's Job. Look, he, he, he's, he's feeding the poor, taking care of widows. Look, he's got wonderful, you know, he's probably, he can't get more righteous than Job. Well, you know, tragedy befalls Job. And the whole book, uh, roughly 40 or so uh, chapters, is a question about theodicy. Hey, if God is good and God chooses a particular group of people to bless them, and if these people are righteous, they will be blessed, right? Well, look at Job, he's righteous. He, he didn't get blessed at all. So what's going on in this God's mind? And this, by the way, is one of the reasons that most people that I know don't want to come to church, right? Hey, you know, if you've got a God who's in control of the world, who's making things like, you know, these tragedies all across the world happen, right? Because ultimately, if there is an omnipotent God, it comes back to him or her, or it comes back to that God. Uh, who, wants, who wants to worship a God who allows or even manifests, make manifest, makes manifest, uh, the suffering of a child doesn't make sense. That's a question called the question of theodicy. Uh, and if you if you like literature, there's a great Russian uh, author, uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, if you know his work, um, book called The Brothers Karamazov, where this is kind of a running theme throughout The Brothers Karamazov. You know. um, uh, there's a brother by the name of Alyosha, who's a Orthodox priest, and then a brother named Ivan, aptly named, you know, we always, I don't know if any Ivan is a good guy, right? <laughs> but this Ivan, who's an atheist, and they're just constantly battling back and forth, and Ivan's always laying it out. Alyosha, look, if you worship a God that can allow for the suffering of just one child, then that's no God that I want to have part of, right? I don't want anything to do with that God. These are the questions that are getting asked in the wisdom literature. And as I say, it is completely removed from any kind of Israelite theology that comes before it, or in many ways comes after it. So that's what we're going to do uh, in this class is look at some of those big questions and how they get, um, uh, how they get uh, considered in the wisdom literature. Those three books, Proverbs, Job, uh, Ecclesiastes, and then some of the Psalms, 
are the texts that um, we can find in the Hebrew Bible, in the Protestant Bible. Did you all know that the Roman Catholics have a different Bible than, it's not really that different. They just have some added books. Uh, they're called, those books are called the Apocrypha. And these books were written in what's known as the intertestamental period, somewhere between 400 BCE and 100 of the Common Era. And the Roman Catholic tradition chose certain books of the Apocrypha to be uh, considered as divinely inspired. So if you go to church in a, you know, a Roman Catholic mass, you will hear possibly a reading from Sirach or a reading from um, Ecclesiasticus uh, or a reading from great books like Susanna and the Elders, Bell and the Dragon. Did you know that there was a dragon in scripture? There is. Not in the Protestant Bible, of course, but in uh, the, uh, the Apocrypha. But there are two books in the Apocrypha, I've already mentioned them here. Um, one called The Wisdom of Solomon, the other called Ecclesiasticus or Sirach. Uh, Wisdom of Solomon is also called the Book of Wisdom. It's very confusing, and it's taken me about 30 years to <laughs> smooth it out and say, oh, they're the same thing. Uh, and then Ecclesiasticus and, and Sirach. Now, when, when was this stuff being written? That's what we're mostly going to be focusing on today. It was written in the so-called intertestamental period between uh, the return from Babylon, and I'll review some of this, and you know the, the coming of the Roman Empire and the coming of Christianity, you might say. Uh, there are other texts in scripture, and when Greg asked me to do that, he said, yeah, look at some of the wisdom literature, like uh, I, I think people like to hear about Esther and Ruth, and I was like, well, guess what, Greg? That's not in. That's not wisdom literature. But it's written at the same time. There's another type of literature that's being written roughly at the same time period, and we will hear from some of that um, in our lectionary uh, in the next uh, several weeks. The Book of Esther, the Book of Ruth, uh, the Book of Jonah. Uh, the book of Daniel, parts of it, uh, comprise a collection of what might be called legend. And I'll, I'll try in our discussion to place that over against wisdom literature, because there are very difficult questions that are being asked uh, at this particular time in history. And um, those questions are going to come back to one of two answers. Do what God says and God will reward you. That's the one answer. Let's call that the Deuteronomic uh, uh, solution to the problem. Or God's ways are mysterious and ineffable. And despite what happens to us here, we know that there is an ordered plan. Right? It's two ways that people tend to, to look at things here. Uh, if you fall too much on the one side of, you know, uh, that God is very rational and logical. If you do something bad, something you know bad will happen to you. If you do something good, God will reward you. Then your life will most likely uh, take a turn for the worse simply because you can't live with any sense of equanimity because yeah, you're always going to be coming up against tragedy no matter what you try to do. So let me let me just stop right there, and I, I've given you just an introduction to the genre to some of the books, but really in order to understand them, we have to know the geography and the history of uh, the context in which these were written. So any questions from the, go ahead, Sharon. Well, you've got 100 CE up there. Yes. Right? And we always think of those as all being old, like before CE, so. Right, right, yes, that's right. And, and that would be the wisdom of, that would be the books of the Apocrypha, uh, like the wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus. But I have those dates up there for a particular reason because they happen to correspond with something that's happening globally that we're going to talk about as well. Um, but right, um, towards the end of this, 100 CE, that would have been about the time that the Gospel of John was being written. Now, you, you might think, well, wait a minute, was, wasn't John being written when Jesus was alive? You know, that would have been like 30 and before. No. Uh, no one was following Jesus around, you know, right? <laughs> uh, everything he had to say. These things were oral traditions that were later written down and then finally uh, made into a narrative. Any other 
questions. Yeah, go ahead. Is apocryphal for the Roman Catholic Church part of the Old Testament or yes, or something different? No, it's part of the Old Testament. Yeah, it's uh, this intertestamental literature. I, I, it's um, there was something known as the Septuagint, uh, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament that included. Now, this would have been around 100 BCE. That included some of those books, the Apocrypha. When the Roman Catholic Church came into power around 400 or so, they took that Septuagint Greek translation, translated it into something known as the Vulgate, which is the Latin translation. And that became the standard text of the Roman Catholic Church. When the Reformation came along, the reformers, people like John Calvin, you know, Martin Luther, uh, they were they were humanists, right? And they were reading texts in their original uh, language. They did not like the idea that there was a, a divinely inspired Old Testament text written in the language other than Hebrew. So they took those texts out and said, this is our Bible. And that's what we've got right here. You know I don't think this has the Apocrypha, but you can get Bibles that have the Apocrypha uh, in them. And they're really interesting to read, especially some of this legendary uh, literature uh, that we're gonna talk about eventually. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Will. Are you gonna talk about the dragon later on? Well, I, can <laughs> I can if you want me to. <laughs> well, you know, I've always wondered if there was some kind of biblical inspiration for Beowulf with Grendel and all that sort of thing. I doubt it, but now all of a sudden I'm that question is awoken in me. Yeah, well, me. I think that's more Norse than anything, but yeah, you I know. never know. Yeah. Um, but I, I'll I'll mention it. It's okay. uh, it, it's not a not major a... feature of the apocrypha, <laughs> but uh, but it is part of this legendary literature that I think you'll recognize uh, when we when we do talk about it. So well, let's talk about oh, was there another question? Did, I, by the way, I love questions. Did Grant. Ann have a question? Are, are you checking? Ann, out? are you there? Do you have a question? Oh, no, I'm good. I'm good. I'm just. Well, we, don't wanna, we, don't, we don't want to lose you here in the fray. No, no. No, I'm just drinking it all in and and some of its review and some of its new ideas and new perspectives. And, and when I have questions, I will holler. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of some of this is review for some of you because we we're kind of at this point in uh, a book that we're reading by John Dominic Crossan called okay. How to Read the Bible and Still Be a Christian. Um, you know, very provocative title, but we're looking at the history of, uh, of the development of violence versus nonviolence uh, in the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament. So let's talk about a watershed event okay. and let's get a sense of our timeline here. Um, the golden age of Israel's theology of Israel's national identity was is a very easy date to remember, 1000 BCE. That's about the time that David became king. Uh, after that, his son Solomon uh, was king. Solomon dies around 922 BCE, and the 12 tribes of Israel split into two kingdoms. Uh, the northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. 200 years later, the northern kingdom of Israel, those 10 tribes, are destroyed by the Assyrians. These crazy militaristic, probably the, the fiercest warriors that history has ever known, came in to the northern kingdom of Israel, just wiped out 10 tribes. This is where we get the so-called lost tribes of, of Israel. But Judah, which was two tribes in the south, which has Jerusalem as its capital, was able to maintain its um, liability by basically paying tribute to the Assyrians. They sold out, basically. Much of the temple treasury was given to the Assyrian kings with names like Tiglath-Pileser. Um, but eventually there was a, uh, a nation state, city state by the name of Babylon. Uh, Babylon uh, is very close to present day, well, it is in present day Iraq and close to present day Baghdad. And the Babylonians rose to power around the end of the seventh century, about 600 BCE. One of the things that they wanted to do is first of all, take over the Assyrians, come down and then take 
you know, the people of Jerusalem away. And what the Babylonians did in order to make sure that they had uh, the possibility of creating a homogeneous culture across their empire, they would take a group of people, let's say Jerusalem, and say, okay, we're going to move you to Babylon. They would take people in Nineveh and say, okay, we're going to move you to Jerusalem. You know, so, so these people do not have their geographical context. Any of their you know, local gods, many of the gods were local. They're completely, um, you know, it's like taking a, a bag of kittens and throwing them out on a country road. I'm sorry, it's a terrible, uh, it's like taking, you know, stray animals and taking them somewhere you don't want them to be. Uh, they, they're probably going to die, right? Because they don't know where to get food. They don't get where to get water. Uh, it was very similar with the Babylonians. Well, the Jews, they weren't being called Jews yet. The Israelites in Jerusalem were taken to Babylon. And there they had to make do for themselves. What the Babylonians wanted was for them to completely assimilate into Babylonian culture. Uh, the Babylonians spoke a language called Aramaic. And Jews were speaking, or the Israelites, as you call them, to be historically accurate. <laughs> the Israelites were speaking Hebrew. Um, think about what happens when you have immigrants coming from, let's say, Mexico into the United States. Usually, the, uh, the first generation of the immigrants maintain the culture of the you know of, of the place from which they which they came but then the children uh they start speaking english they start doing all of the things that american children do they start you know rooting for the huskers instead of their mech you know their their kick football uh, soccer teams in mexico and there's a cultural transformation that starts to take place and the parents if i understand correctly and situations that I know about, uh, somewhat regret the fact that their children are losing track of their culture. That was what was happening in, in Babylon as well. You have Israelites who uh, are coming from one cultural context and going into another, and the changes are monumental. So what was it like if you were an Israelite in Jerusalem prior to the Babylonian, it was called the Babylonian captivity. Uh, the last deportation happened around 587, and they were there for roughly 50 years to 539. First of all, they had their capital city, Jerusalem, city of David. Uh, this is a city that had the long history that, uh, you know, that this was God's city on a hill. Um, there was a, uh, the idea that can be found in the prophet Isaiah, that eventually one day all of the nations of the world would come to Jerusalem and there would be peace that would reign throughout, you know, throughout the earth. Well, that appeared to have been completely under, undermined. Uh, they had a king who was taken to captivity. They weren't allowed to have a king now when they went to Babylon. Uh, they had a temple. The temple, even though the treasury had been had stolen mostly by the Assyrians, they were still doing sacrifices there because their theology was this. If you need to uh, appease God in any way, there needs to be some sort of blood sacrifice or atoning sacrifice that happens in only one place in the Jerusalem temple. Uh, and shortly before the Babylonian captivity, there was a king by the name of Josiah who made the temple like the only place where people could come into the presence of God, which is, you know, has its pros and its cons. But this is um, the source of a tradition that still holds today that the only place to truly celebrate Passover or any of the Jewish holy days is in the presence of the temple. Of course, we know there is no temple and that creates some problems because what is in place of the temple is a Muslim shrine known as the Dome of the Rock. And there you have the source of much of the strife of the Middle East right now. Um, there was a royal theology that said that God placed David on the throne and that this was God's chosen king, that God was that David was a representative of all uh, that was good and right, as well as there is um, this notion of what's known as covenant faithfulness. This is that theology I told you about. Uh, if you do what God requires of you, 
then God will reward you. If you do not do that, and you know it, it's a heinous enough sin, God is going uh, to punish you. Very simple, and it's pretty much the source of what we know of any kind of fundamentalist religion, whether it's Jewish or Christian or or uh, uh, Islamic or or other <coughs> kinds of fundamentalism. You know, you you have fun. That's what fundamentals are, right? These are the things you do. These are the things that you don't. Well, all of that, all of that is assurance that Jerusalem was a place uh, that was going to be the light of the world gets completely undermined uh, in 587. Here's a, a picture. I can't remember who painted this. I'm sorry to say, but the destruction of the temple uh, that happens in 587. You can see the Babylonian army here down in the lower right. Um, actually, this this uh, painting, it would not be historically accurate because this wall right here is most likely a Roman wall, <laughs> just so you know. But, but this is, you know, I just want to give you something to look at so you just didn't have text there the whole time. But this is what happened. <clears throat> hey, Dan, uh, go ahead. Where would the Mount of Olives be in relationship? Can you tell? Yep, right up here. You'd be looking down, the yeah. Jordan Valley, you'd yeah. be up here. Thank you. Yeah, um, this is kind of taken just a little bit north of the Mount of Olives. Yeah. Not there. Um, anyway, so so how did all of this happen? Around 597, the Babylonians come into Jerusalem. They take away all the craftsmen, all the, the people who were uh, aristocrats and who had skills. And then over the next seven or eight years or so, they come and take people and take them off to Babylon. And there they live in a kind of a refugee camp along the uh, uh, river known as Kabar River. And if you know the Psalm, you know, by the waters of Babylon, we lay down and wept. Uh, that is where this experience uh, comes from. When they were in Babylon uh, in exile, they didn't have a temple. So they had to come up with a new way to worship. And instead of going to the temple and bringing your sacrifice, sacrificing it on the altar, what they did is they said, hey, we still have this. We still have the Torah, right? They took the Torah with them. And so the Torah becomes the new temple. And explication of the Torah in what's known as synagogue worship services Synagogue is where people would come together and a rabbi would speak about a text, you know, usually read like we do with uh, the common lectionary. And that becomes really the model of what we're going to do in about 20 or 30 minutes or so. It, it becomes the standard order of worship. You, you approach God in praise, adoration, you confess your sins, you hear the scripture read, you hear the rabbi explain the scripture or give a, a, a uh, a sermon on the scripture, uh, and then you leave with a renewed sense of, of your identity as a, as a Israelite. Um, these were the so-called people of Judah living in Babylon. And this is when they come to be known as Jews. There, there are no Jews prior to Babylon. I mean, there are Israelites, but you, you can see how, you know, the name gets kind of transformed. Well, those Judahites over there, those Judahites living by the Kabar River of the Jews. And, and with that new name comes a, a new theology, really, in a lot of ways. Uh, you've got synagogue worship, and you've got some new theological questions being asked, right? We were, we were doing everything just fine, you know? Uh, we were faithful to God as best we could be. We sacrificed to God. We followed the Torah, and look what's happened. Is God punishing us? Well, some would say, yeah, that's, that's the answer. You weren't doing what you were supposed to do. Others were saying, uh, I, don't think it's that, I don't think it's that simple. You know, because what's happening here, there's also this uh, transformation in thinking about who God is. Up until this time, the Israelites were not strictly monotheists. To be a monotheist means that you believe that there's only one God and no others. Well, we know from Deuteronomy, I'm the Lord your God, 
brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, what comes after that? You shall have no other gods before me. Wait a minute. Now, that doesn't sound like monotheism, does it? No, it's not monotheism. It's something known as henotheism, this recognition that there were other gods out there, uh, but we worship our tribal god, and we don't give allegiance to those other gods. Well, it's about this time that people start to make more universalizing, uh, have more universalizing insights. They ask questions about what is happening uh, in the heavens, right? And the most important question is, whose God is more powerful here? Because there's this great God in Babylon called Marduk. Think about that, you know, let's use our analogy again to uh, immigrant families coming from Mexico. There's this great God in Babylon called Marduk. Let's look at them, it's a Husker football team. Okay, <laughs> but then there is the God that we know so well, and his name was Elohim or Yahweh. That's the old way that we played football and soccer, right? Which one of these is legit, right? Um, and the thing that they needed to do for 50 years is try to convince their kids that Marduk, Husker football, if you will, is illegitimate. It is our God who is over Marduk. Well, if that's the case, why are we sitting here with barely anything to eat on the Kabar River, you know, in constant threat of assimilation? Well, that's what we don't know. But our faith is going to maintain that God has a plan, that God is a much more universal God. And this is the, this is the place where um, you know, when they were coming together in synagogues every Sabbath, one of the things that they would do, they would have their affirmation of faith. You know how we have the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed. They would affirm their faith in Babylon in this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. The Spirit of God hovered over the face of the deep. And darkness was on the face of the water. And God said, let there be light. It was light. Then God you know, creates, separates the water from the earth, and God hangs the sun and the moon and the, the, the sky, creates vegetation, animals, all of those things. Six days God works, the seventh day God rests. Why, why were they doing that every time they go to the synagogue? Well, because there's a story among the Babylonians that this God Marduk, uh, in a very violent way, kills his grandmother. Uh, a woman named, or a goddess named Tiamat, cuts her up, throws part of her into the heavens and creates the stars, throws part of her down below and creates the earth, so that everything in the universe what has some sort of divine quality to it. And so you could look up, if you're a Babylonian, you can look up and say, look, look at the stars, there's one of our gods, and there is a god over there. And so when you read the first chapter of Genesis and understand that context, you know that what they're trying to say is, the Jews are trying to say is, you Babylonians who think the stars and the sun, the moon are gods, guess what? Our God created them. It's the way to affirm the ascendancy of God over all other gods. And this is going to become a theme in the wisdom literature. It's going to be a primary theme in the wisdom literature. The God of creation um, creates a world of order. And that order can be known if you just simply take the time and have the faith to discern the order in the world, to discern that order in the world. It, it, it represents a new kind of faithfulness, uh, you might say. I got to read my. So, yes, this idea of uh, the integrity of creation. So Babylon was a watershed event. Let me stop there and see if there are uh, any questions or comments that you would like to make. Completely new way of being in the world. But lo and behold, then, 538 BCE, there's a king by the name of Cyrus, Cyrus who comes to Persia uh, and defeats the Babylonians and says, hey, you Jews, 
you're doing okay in Jerusalem. You guys just go back to where you were. And I just want to make sure that you pay the tribute you're supposed to. You worship your God the way you want to. And uh, everything will be just, just honky-dory. Um, well, that's all well and good. But guess what? By this time, there were several schools of theology that the Jews were trying to uh, promulgate. One of those schools said, hey, look, um, let's go back and, and do what we did before. 50 years ago, let's rebuild the temple, the sacrifice to God, let's do everything right. Let's, um, you know, with the use of our rabbis and, and our new priests, let's really study the law and let's create this whole list of, you know, laws that we need to follow. And if we do that, then God is not going to punish us. And there's a group known as the Pharisees in Jesus' day who had 613 laws that they would follow uh, to try, you know, some of those had to do with uh, uh, things that you should do. Others had to do with things that you should not do. But um, the way that that developed was precisely at this time. If we just build a big enough wall around ourselves, if we just strain our will, constrain our will enough that we do not, you know, fall by the wayside, then everything will just be fine. That's one school of thought. But then there's this other school of thought that has taken this 50 years and said, that's just not that easy. <laughs> it's just not that easy, you know? Um, your God is still, a, the God you're trying to emphasize here is one, still one of those old tribal gods. And what Babylon has taught us is that we're not worshiping a tribal God. We're worshiping the God who created the universe. And this God is far more uh, complex than what our human mind uh, can grasp. Yes, the covenant is great, but look what you do. You're turning that into a God itself, right? If, if, if all you do is just follow every last jot and tittle of the law, then who are you really worshiping? You're worshiping the law instead of the giver of the law. What does it mean for us to truly worship the giver of the law? Well, it means for us to uh, have a sense of the ineffable nature of God, the incomprehensible nature of this uh, divine being who created it was just not, you know, a tribal God, but created the entire universe. So um, any, any questions before I get into a little geography here? All right, well, Anne, are you with us still? Any questions? Nope. All right, you'll recognize these maps. Um, just so we have a sense of, I'm, I'm sure this isn't the case with most of you, but 90% uh, of our high school students in the United States cannot locate states in the United States, let alone international, uh, you know, uh, international international uh, points of geographical interest. But you you can tell here where we're where we are. You've got the Mediterranean, and then over here you can see Babylon, and this is the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley, known anciently as Mesopotamia. Meso mean in the middle of the rivers. This is the seat of Western civilization. So this is the, the, the empire of the Babylonians, right? Uh, you can see Jerusalem over here by the, by the Dead Sea. Then came a group known as the Persians and they expanded their empire even further east uh, into you know, well, what, what we know today is, is present day Iran, Afghanistan, all the way to the Indus River Valley. That's a huge empire. So you can see how Cyrus really didn't want to spend a lot of time with a small group of people in Jerusalem, you know, trying to maintain order there. Basically, he tripled the Babylonian uh, empire all the way down into Egypt. And this was going to be uh, mostly the empires of the ancient Near East. After Persia, uh, Came this young upstart, this uh, <laughs> student of yeah. uh, Aristotle by the name of uh, Alexander the Great. And you can see uh, Alexander's from Macedonia. He's, we're adding Turkey here, Asia Minor there, what's well, present day Turkey to the empire. 
he comes and basically in a matter of eight or 10 years, takes over the entire Persian empire. Now, why am I showing you all these things? Well, one of the reasons is that it's always good to know our geography, right? Uh, the Mediterranean there, especially since this is such a hot spot for us today. Um, and old tribal uh, loyalties that go back thousands of years are still causing us problems there. Uh, but the other reason is important to know this is that the context out of which our theology grows is like the soil in which you place a seed. You know, uh, it may be uh, the same seed, but if it's a really rich soil, it's going to grow profusely. If it's a really dry soil or you know very arid, uh, uh, not very nutrient rich, it's going to grow in a, in a different way. Uh, the same thing with the theology that we're talking about here. Uh, the context of the wisdom tradition owes a lot to this geography. And this is a place I want to introduce the broader context because there's something happening. Look at these dates, 500 BCE to 100 of Tong era, that's what you're talking about. There's something that's happening around the world that we might call a global paradigm shift that's happening in terms of human consciousness. Prior to this time, uh, people tended to be very tribal, uh, had their tribal gods very isolated under themselves. But when you look at the expanse of that empire and you look at the trade routes that were created all the way down to India, all the way over to present day Greece, down into Egypt, uh, there are a lot of exchanging of ideas that's happening. And so who knows why this happened, but my guess would be is that that expansion, that geographical expansion of uh, knowledge, you might say, created a kind of simultaneous uh, bursting forth of a, what we might call a universalizing consciousness. Uh, instead of thinking of us versus them, the them tend now to be considered in terms of, well, maybe they do things somewhat uh, similarly to us instead of they do things way differently than us. No, maybe those Chinese people are similar to us. So what does it mean to be human, for example? What is it that can draw me and the person from China together instead of separating us, right? And it was this uh, kind of question that really brought about this, this flourishing of human consciousness. This is the time known as the ax axial age, it's flourishing of universal consciousness. And we think of all of the great philosophers that are working or living at this time, the Greeks, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, in India, you've got Hinduism, uh, particularly a, a book known as the Upanishads, and actually, I'd like to spend more time on the Upanishads because they're probably the closest example of a non-Western religion to what we're going to read about in the wisdom literature. Um, and in fact, the word Upanishad means to sit down at the feet of a, a teacher. And that's what our wisdom tradition that talks about. You know, let me give you these proverbs, my son. I'm going to tell you, you know, how to live your life. Um, but there was a, uh, a man who, you know, Siddhartha Gautama, who really challenged some of the ideas of the Upanishads, uh, and he came to be known as the Buddha or the enlightened one. So this is happening probably around 480 uh, BC is when uh, the Buddha dies. In Persia, there is a uh, prophet by the name of Zoroaster, also known as Zarathustra. Um, and I got to tell you, I think this is a guy that messed everything, messed everything <laughs> up. Because in the midst of this universalizing tendency, the people were trying to recognize commonalities amongst themselves. Uh, Zoroaster introduced into the world a dualistic cosmology, forces of darkness and forces of light fighting against each other. The forces of darkness worship a dark god by the name of uh, Angra Mainyu, the forces of light worship a 
god of light by the name of Ahura Mazda. And they would be clashing it out until the end of time and until finally light would overcome darkness. Does that sound familiar at all? Because, <laughs> because that's going to be introduced, as you might guess, into the, the Israelite tradition. Uh, in China, uh, Confucius on the political scene is trying to uh, establish ways that uh, you know, some of the some of the very militaristic rulers could not just waste their time killing each other, but actually try to develop a society that, that worked well for all people. And Lao Tzu uh, wrote a book called, um, we didn't write it, he created a tradition uh, called Taoism. Uh, probably another Eastern example of the kind of uh, insights we're gonna get in wisdom literature, that there's this Tao, this way of, how the world works, how the cosmos works as kind of a flowing stream. And we can do one of two things. We can either jump into the stream and flow with it, we can jump into the swim and swim against it, right? And guess which one is going to be better for human health and for, for you know, social um, well-being. Uh, and so if we take, though he does not talk about wisdom, Lao Tzu talks about the Tao, but we might, that's T-A-O is how it's spelled, uh, but we might take that definition and supplant it into the wisdom tradition and talk about just simply wisdom. There's a wisdom to the way the cosmos works, established by God. Um, of course, we know at this time, towards the end of the axial age, Jesus comes to Palestine, there's a theology among the Jews called diaspora theology. Um, if you go back to our, our uh, and I'll go back a couple, well, I can do it here. If you go back to our, uh, our geography map here, when the Jews came back from Babylon, some of them stayed in Babylon. They said, hey, we're doing fine here. We, you know, we've got a synagogue where we can read the Torah. You guys go build your temple, have fun. Uh, maybe we'll see at Passover. Uh, before uh, the Babylonian captivity, there were some Jews, who, some Israelites, I should say, who traveled from Jerusalem down into Egypt. And there's a legend that goes that, that the Ark of the Covenant went with them. This is the source of our, you know, uh, movie, uh, what was it called? Indiana, Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones and the, and and the, the last story. Uh, yeah, right. No, in the Ark of the Covenant, or Raiders of the Lost. Raiders of the Raiders, yeah. So now we have three different Jewish communities all developing their theology in different ways. So uh, this reflection on Torah comes to be known as Mishnah and then Talmud, but there are various reflections, some of them happening in Babylon, some in Jerusalem, some in Egypt. And we see some of the same universalizing tendency as well. And then finally, um, the wisdom schools of Egypt and Greece, where people would ally themselves with a particular uh, instructor, uh, philosopher, and basically, basically be devoted to this so-called hermetic wisdom that was like a, a secret wisdom, uh, kind of the source of many of our uh, secret societies like the Masons and the Odd Fellows, things like that, same type, type of idea. But all of these people are asking the big questions, asking the big questions about who is God? What is the nature of God? Who are human beings with respect to God? What is the nature of, uh, of a human being? What are we called to do? What does it mean to do good? What does it mean to be righteous? All of those things. It's a flourishing of consciousness that unfortunately, does not get the recognition that it should, should get, I think, in the Hebrew Bible. So in the next three sessions, I'm hoping to really unlock some of the, or, you know, uh, unfold some of those questions that get answered. We'll look at Proverbs. Job is gonna be in the lectionary for two Sundays from now. I think it's best to probably start with Job. So we're gonna do Job next week. Um, and then, um, I, I'm also going at this time to introduce you to some of the so-called legendary literature that's being written precisely at the same time to try to answer some of these questions, but in a, in a more narrative type of way. So any questions? Because it's almost... Okay. All right. All right.
be hot as I am. Mm -hmm. I think it's rather warm. It's a little sunny. Well, great. And well, you well, have yeah, go ahead. It's just there were no others. So I've read that one of the wise men was Zoroastrian. Is that your reading? Well, you know, they were wise men who come from the East. Yes. And in this comfort. case, East yes. usually represented Persia. Yeah. And uh, they were the ones who, who tended to, again, what we're talking about, look to the stars yeah. because the order of the cosmos yeah. could be seen in the planets and thus the order of human beings could be discerned in the planets that we could just match our will up with that, right? There's gonna be a later Greek philosophy called Stoicism that is going to develop out of this very idea as well. But you're right. Um, yeah, the people, the men, come, the wise men coming from the East, probably Persian Zoroastrian astrologers. Mm -hmm. So okay. but that's where you get this, this, yeah. this sense of, you know, the, the emphasis on creation itself. Let's not look to our texts, the universe, nature, creation can tell us what needs to be known. So thank you, everyone. I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to Ann here and we'll stop our recording. But uh, I'll see you next week if I haven't, you know, pulled the rug out from under you already. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Ann. Bye bye. Thanks. And I'll see you later. Yeah. Are you I love that thing. And when you get the back to the field, it's part of what we call that.